Thanks for inviting me to talk today. It's a real privilege to be able to speak uh, to so many uh, advocates with so much positive energy around lung cancer. Um, 20 years ago, there, there was almost no support for people and their families um, who were on the journey of, of facing lung cancer together and for people, people surviving. Uh, you're gonna have another couple of excellent speakers. Uh, one tonight, Dr. Jared Weiss, who's gonna be talking about some of the future directions in small cell lung cancer. And tomorrow, Stephen Liu, who's one of the uh, certainly national leaders in establishing immune therapy as a potential treatment. So I'm gonna not spend a lot of time emphasizing things that they may be talking about. Um, so I'm gonna try to cover some of the, the biology, screening, general treatments, atmosphere, and, and, and kind of what is, what is coming along, okay? And uh, feel free to stop me at any time if you have questions or you wanna talk about something, okay? Uh, this is a picture of um, our, our Cancer Institute, Built about 10 years ago, big, big glass building uh, in Durham, North Carolina, and we refer to it as uh, uh, sometimes my, our, the mothership for the Duke Cancer uh, Enterprise. Um, of course, less than 10 miles away is UNC. Uh, we compete against fiercely uh, in basketball, uh, but we cooperate pretty well in the medical area, certainly in lung cancer, we, we cooperate and work together. Uh, but but this, is, this is the view of, of UNC for our, our mothership. A little bit different view of the mothership, perhaps the uh, uh, Star Wars Death Star. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so this is a picture of the uh, lungs. Uh, and this, this gives an idea of how small cell lung cancer develops. So often in the central part of the lung, in the lining of the lung, in the, in, the, in the airways, there are a lot of different cells. Most of them are what we would call epithelial cells, which are cells that are similar or, or derived from the same sort of tissues that, that generate our skin, the, the cells that line our mouths. And when these cells get exposed to carcinogens, and turn into cancers, we think that mostly they turn into non-small cell lung cancers, which makes up about 85% of, of lung cancer. Within these carpets of epithelial cells are neuroendocrine cells, cells that are akin to cells that arise in neuroendocrine organs like the thyroid gland, <clears throat> the adrenal glands, parts of the brain. And when those cells get exposed, <clears throat> sorry, to carcinogens, such as, and particularly for small cell lung cancer, smoking, they can turn into small cell lung cancer. So you can see up here on the top, you've got layers of cells, oh, thank you. Um, and then you have a neuroendocrine cell kind of stuck in there uh, among mostly cells that are, that are just lining the lungs. They, they have a couple of key mutations. In this case, RB1 and TP53 are critical ones in small cell lung cancer. Those are tumor suppressor genes. Those are genes that normally function to make proteins that prevent the development of cancer. And particularly for small cell lung cancer, mutations happen in those genes so that the proteins that would prevent cancer are defective, and that helps give rise to the cancer. And then a number of different things happen that eventually these neuroendocrine cells that normally line the lung become more and more abnormal to the point where they become a cancer. And that's how small cell lung cancer, we think, is mostly generated. Here's a picture of small cell lung cancer. They call it small because indeed the cells are small. They tend to have a big nucleus for the size of the cell. And they have a very specific characteristic that really allows pathologists 
to say, aha, this looks like a small cell. And then they'll look on the cell surface at different proteins that will allow a pathologist to make the diagnosis. So what happens in a patient's journey is that <clears throat> they develop some sign or some symptom that leads to an x-ray being done. A biopsy is done, sometimes by a bronchoscopy where they put the scope down the throat and take a sample from in the lung. Sometimes a needle is stuck into the lung to biopsy a tumor. That sample is given to a pathologist. They look at it under a microscope and they say what kind of cancer it is. So this is the sort of picture that they look at and the kind of analysis that is done. The incidence of small cell lung cancer is going down somewhat. So this shows the incidence of small cell lung cancer in men and women from 1975 to about 2015. The rate of smoking in the United States was highest around 1960. In 1962, the US Attorney General said smoking is bad for you. In the 1950s, there were all sorts of advertisements for different cigarettes. They would say, your doctor smokes Marlboros. <laughs> you know, and they would have movie stars like Ronald Reagan, you know, promoting a certain cigarette or something like that. And it really wasn't until um, the US Surgeon General came out and said, smoking can cause heart disease and cancer, that the smoking rate in men went from about 50% plus down to now about 15% in the US public. <coughs> Women were kind of at a low level and they've kind of come up to 15%. So that now that's about the rate. Most small cell lung cancer that we consider classic small cell lung cancer arises in people that were former or current smokers. There should be no stigma about, stigma about smoking. Both of my parents smoked most of their adult lives and they were good people. Right? So many medical problems are related to behavior. So adult onset diabetes is related to weight and, and eating and activity habits. A lot of heart disease is related to behavior, diet, lack of exercise and, 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 and other things. So there are most chronic diseases in the United States are related to behavior. And smoking should be no more stigmatized than any other behavior that leads or contributes to some chronic illness. Okay, so I, I think that's really important. And I think that's a, a major area for lung cancer advocacy to overcome the stigma associated with, with previous or current smoking. Okay. Now, the, the incidence of small cell lung cancer has gone down, but it's still significant. So how do we diagnose small cell lung cancer? Sometimes the cancer causes symptoms directly. Sometimes perineoplastic syndromes develop, and I'm gonna talk about those in a minute, that the lung cancer causes or, or instigates indirectly. And then lung cancer screening, I think more and more. So small cell lung cancer often arises in the central airways shown here by the primary tumor. And then it has a propensity to go to the lymph nodes early in the course of the disease, and then can spread through the blood to these other sites. So sometimes someone with small cell lung cancer will develop a cough, pain in a bone, or neurologic symptom, or, or something else that alerts the patient, their family, and then ultimately the healthcare providers that there's a problem that needs to be diagnosed. There's something called perineoplastic syndromes, and these are syndromes that are associated with something that the cancer causes. So this is perineoplastic syndromes for neuroendocrine syndromes. So like I, I told you earlier, small cell lung cancer is a high-grade neuroendocrine cancer. Neuroendocrine, can, neuroendocrine cells in the body produce proteins that have effects. So kind of like hormones. 
kind of similar to estrogen or testosterone, thyroid hormone, uh, adrenal hormone. And sometimes the small cell will make, the small cell cancer cells will make excess amounts of a protein. So antidiuretic hormone is a, a hormone that the cancer can produce that then causes the kidneys to waste sodium. And someone can become diagnosed because their sodium level in their blood goes so low that they become sick. This wasn't caused directly by the tumor. It was caused by a humor or a protein, neuroendocrine protein released by the tumor. So we consider this a perineoplastic syndrome. And there are a number of uh, uh, neuroendocrine products that the cancer can release and then uh, present with a perineoplastic syndrome. So antidiuretic hormone with low sodium is one. Cushing syndrome where too much of adrenal, um, uh, adrenal cortical thyroid hormone is expressed and can make people have swelling and weight gain, okay? Another type of perineoplastic syndrome is an autoimmune phenomena. So these are neuroendocrine cells. They're cells that are like nerve cells. And sometimes the presence of the cancer will cause the immune system to react against the cancer. But then the immune system reacts against something in our own bodies, a similar protein. So one would be Lambert-Eaton syndrome where the immune system reacts against the cancer, but then it also reacts against a component of the neuromuscular synapse that allows our muscles to work. So people may present with muscle weakness, okay? Like myasthenia gravis. And then there are a whole bunch of them where people could have ataxia, where, where the immune system reacts against the cerebellum, which is a part of the brain that allows us to have balance. So this is just to mention a couple of ways that small cell lung cancer uniquely, unique from other types of cancers, can become apparent and, and lead to diagnosis. Sometimes this is a good thing because sometimes the presentation of these perineoplastic syndromes occurs when the cancer is early stage, at an early stage where we can diagnose it and, tr and cure it. So that in some ways, the perineoplastic syndromes can be helpful. So lung cancer screening has become important. We do lung cancer screening mostly to identify non-small cell lung cancer. But at the same population at highest risk for non-small cell lung cancer is also the population at risk for small cell lung cancer. So there was a large trial done, the lung cancer screening trial that was funded by the National Institute of Health and had over 50,000 people who had smoked a significant amount and were middle-aged. And they had either had a regular chest X-ray done or a low dose CAT scan done every year. And the patients that had CAT scans had significantly more early stage lung cancer identified, leading to the diagnosis and treatment of a lot of stage one lung cancers where the cancer is highly curable. And this made a big difference in, in reduction of risk so that not only did it identify more cancers, it caused a marked reduction in dying from lung cancer, and an overall improvement in mortality that was significant. So just not lung cancer mortality, all-cause mortality. So that for people who fit these criteria and had CT scans uh, uh, screenings, had a substantial improvement in, um, in chances of overall survival. And if this was implemented in the United States now to people that are eligible, it would save about 15,000 lives a year. So with a slightly broadened criteria, because it's really important that we broaden the criteria a bit for the screening. And the way that the, no, it wasn't intentional, but if you go by the, 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 the criteria that were used in the clinical trial, those eligibility criteria tend to exclude for complex reasons, people from minority communities 
who are tend to be disadvantaged and not given as much access to screening as should anyway. So it's a, you know, an important thing for lung cancer community to do is broaden the screening criteria that are accepted by Medicare and other third party payers, because that's where the rubber hits the road, so that everybody who is likely to benefit can benefit from this. The number of people that need to be screened, yes, yes. Between uh, the low dose CT scan, spiral CT scan, uh, yeah. with and without uh, uh, perfusion. So maybe if you could explain kind of the, the difference, how that works and why and when it's used. So, um, so, with so kind of a diagnosis, like a, like a regular CT scan has a certain dose of radiation. And, and compared to when this trial was done, even a standard CT scan has become so much faster and uses so much less radiation that it's not all that much, okay? But specifically, the low-dose spiral CT scan is one that's done pretty fast, and the total exposure to radiation is less. So, so the total amount of exposure to radiation is, is not that much. Terry? Here. You know, it might be the total dose of radiation that you get one, during the course of a year just being exposed to the ambient environment and the sun. So it's not a huge, it's not like therapeutic radiation. You know, the dose of radiation that, that you use to treat a cancer is substantial. These diagnostic tests have orders of magnitude less than that. So, um, with con you know, when, when you give contrast, that allows you to get a much better look at the mediastinal lymph nodes and other, and, and the blood vessels. And if you were worried about a pulmonary embolism, a blood clot in the lungs, then it's critical to give contrast. Whereas if all you're looking for is a lung nodule, like a nodule sitting in the middle of the lung parenchyma, it's, it's not needed. And, and, and I don't, I would say that 90 to 95% of the CT scans of the chest that I order, I don't use contrast. Yes. Um, you may have already answered it. When I, I had that, um, the screening thing, yes. and they found a nodule in the yes. center of my lungs, mm -hmm. and they told me to come back in a year. Right. And by so, then, I was full blown in the hospital, oh, you know, yeah. and now they tell me I'm gonna die. Right. So I'm trying to understand yeah. why something wasn't done why, why a year? Why not? Right, right. So that's complex and it's, it's not, you know, without knowing the specifics, it's important to co comment for sure. Like mostly, mostly we're doing the, the data around, around this study is, is mostly focused on non-small cell lung cancer because that makes up about 80 to 90% of lung cancer, okay? Um, small cell lung cancer would tend to grow more quickly than non-small cell. Right. For your typical lung nodule where you're worried about non-small cell lung cancer, there's data available from thousands and thousands and thousands of patients and CAT scans for people who were followed for many, many years. So there's very strong data-driven algorithms where you can say, if it's between this number of millimeters and that number of millimeters, that the risk of doing a surgery or doing a biopsy is higher than the chances of, of actually treating a cancer. If generally, if the nodule has a typical appearance of, of being a non-calcified nodule that's a centimeter, like a half an inch or more in size, then that is something you would go after immediately. Where if it's like a quarter of an inch, three eighths of an inch in size, the odds are that that's benign and you do a follow-up CAT scan and if it gets bigger, then you'd go after it. So there were, there were very specific algorithms with recommendations from the American Radiologic Society that's, that's data-driven based on, based on thousands and thousands of, of data, you know, people over many years that gives us pretty accurate information. Now, there'll be people that fall out of that um, 
but probably for every person where the cancer kind of jumps ahead, there are three people that might have died from a biopsy that, that was done when it, when it didn't need to be. So it's, it's difficult. It's, it's, we don't have any algorithm at this point to get it 100% right. There are various things that are going forward, like um, artificial intelligence, so that you have a computer that's looking at every pixel you know, in the image to, to give a more refined answer. There are biomarkers in the blood and even in expired air that are being evaluated to be able to look at the nodule and then another biomarker and then combined, it gives us a more accurate reading as to what it is and whether it should be acted on or we don't have to act on it. So, so we have a certain amount of information and, and there's a tremendous amount of research going on to try to refine that so that, that we don't miss anyone, so. There's just two of us in this room here that yeah. exact same thing yeah. happened to. It's kind of like, yes. Hmm. <laughs> what? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So to prevent one lung cancer, about 320 people have to be in lung cancer screening. To prevent one breast cancer death, over a thousand women need to be in screening and colonoscopy over 500. So the effort, you know, so the, the efficacy, the ability to identify cancer is right there with colonoscopy, mammography, and we ought to loosen up the criteria around lung cancer screening to allow more people to be screened. If you wanna get a mammography as a provider, all you have to do is snap your fingers and everything is set up, boy, it just happens. Nobody questions it, everybody will pay for it. But if it's, if it's lung cancer screening, it has to be dual decision-making. You have to do all these criteria. If you're a busy family physician, if you're a busy family practitioner, general internal medicine doctor, making people jump through those hoops, fill out the extra forms, do all this stuff, it all inhibits it. It all inhibits, decreases the amount of screening that's gonna be done. And this is tied to the stigma of lung cancer around smoking. To some extent, it's around, well, these people did it to themselves, so we're gonna make it extra, extra hurdles to go over to get the screening done. And, and that, that should be a focus for the lung cancer support community, advocates, to lower the threshold for screening to be right where it is for like mammography and colonoscopy. So for small cell lung cancer, it does tend to grow pretty quickly. So we don't usually identify lung cancer when it's small cell lung cancer when it's a very early stage and easy to resect. That's getting a little better with lung cancer screening. We are identifying some small cell lung cancer. I'm probably seeing one or two cases a year that are, that are picked up on screening. About a third present with limited extent disease. And, and we have one of my colleagues from UNC going to be talking about radiation treatment for lung cancer. I'm sure we'll go into that in great detail. Uh, unfortunately, the majority of patients with small cell lung cancer present and are diagnosed at a time when the cancer has spread and we don't typically cure the cancer. For small cell lung cancer, because even in early stage cancer, there's probably microscopic spread, the foundation for treatment is chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is very effective in, initially. And in the cases of early stage small cell lung cancer, the ones that we can, um, the, the surgical treatment, the ones where we can just do surgery and take it out, or the limited extent where we can treat it all with radiation and chemo. In those situations where we're treating microscopic minimal amount of disease, we can cure the cancer with, with chemotherapy sometimes. So typically patients with small cell lung cancer, no matter what the stage, will get chemotherapy. 
This shows a picture of what would be a, a potentially surgical cancer, where you have just a small tumor out there in the middle of the lung, and it hasn't spread anywhere. So small tumors haven't spread anywhere, or maybe it's just spread to one lymph node right nearby. This is limited extent small cell lung cancer, where there might be a tumor in the center of the lung. There are lymph nodes that you can see there in white that designate lymph nodes that might have cancer in them. But all of this cancer can be included within a radiation field. So that a radiation oncologist could, could conform a field to include all of the cancer we can see. And then the combination of radiation and chemotherapy does have the potential to cure the cancer. So there's, there's definitely hope in this situation. So typically in limited extent disease, we would give four cycles of chemotherapy. Radiation, and one of my colleagues from UNC is gonna talk about the specifics of that, so I'm not gonna get into that. And then various uh, strategies to either treat or watch out for spread of cancer to the brain. There are lots of clinical trials going on to see whether or not adding immune therapy during or after the radiation improves the cure rate. We're not there yet. That's still a matter of clinical trials in the limited extent setting. So an extensive stage small, sun can small lung cancer, again, we're not where we need to be, but there's hope. There's hope for everyone diagnosed with small cell lung cancer now to live a long time. We're not where we need to be. But any patient I see with small cell lung cancer has the potential to be living years later and doing well. And that's different than it was 10 years ago. We're not making progress as fast as we need to, but we are making progress, there's no doubt about it. This is a clinical trial with the lead author for the big publication was Dr. Liu, who you're gonna hear from tomorrow. He's an excellent speaker, um, so I'm not gonna go into great detail on the studies that he'll present to you. But basically we found out that if we add immune therapy, an intravenous protein that takes the breaks off the immune system, that it improves overall survival, and more importantly, it improves the number of people who are alive one and two and three and four years later. 10 years ago, in extensive stage small cell lung cancer, we could not routinely talk about two and three and four years later. This was a trial design, basically standard chemotherapy with or without immune therapy. This is toxicity. It was pretty well tolerated. We did not see that much added toxicity on top of standard chemotherapy. There was another positive trial, the Caspian trial, that looked at another immune therapy. The first trial was an immune therapy called atezolizumab. This is a, an immune therapy called diverlimab. They hit the same target, very much like Coke and Pepsi, okay? Similar, a little bit different, but basically the same result. So again, chemotherapy with or without the immune therapy. This is a survival slide that is not what we want. We want to see most people living a long time. We want to see most people cured or turn the cancer into chronic disease, and we're not there yet. But if you look off at the right-hand corner side there, out past two years, you see that the curve has leveled off, that it's flat. That's what we call the tail on the curve. It's no longer going down. We think that these are patients where the immune therapy has set up a chronic, persistent reaction against the cancer, where your body's own immune system has the potential to treat and control the cancer for years, maybe forever. From some of the early non-small cell lung cancer trials, I have a patient who's 10 years in complete remission after immune therapy alone. And I think we're, gonna, we're getting there for some cases of small cell lung cancer. And much of the research that you're gonna be here, myself, 
Dr. Weiss, Dr. Liu talk about is trying to improve on this. Okay. There are second line chemotherapies for small cell lung cancer that have modest benefit. Topotecan, lurbanectidin, weekly taxol, gemcitabine, there are a number of chemotherapy agents that can benefit some people, but the side effects are modest and the side effects are significant. The biggest area of unmet need in small cell lung cancer is to have good, effective, well-tolerated regimens after first-line treatment. This is where some of that benefit may come. I talked about the small cell lung cancer being a neuroendocrine cancer. So these cancers have proteins on their surface that are neuroendocrine associated type proteins. Sometimes proteins associated with neuroendocrine cells from before we're born. So ones that are important in fetal development, but then once you're an adult, they're gone. So these proteins that are present on some of these neuroendocrine cells like the DLL3, the glucosal GM1, uh, and some others I'm gonna show you in a minute, are present on neuroendocrine cells to a little degree in the normal ones, but to a high degree in some of the cancerous ones so that we can develop targets that hit those specific proteins. And because those specific proteins are not on our normal brain cells, our lung cells, our bone marrow cells, our liver cells, we don't see toxicity, toxicity in those places. So there's the potential to deliver immune therapy or chemotherapy directly to the cancer cell and avoid the rest of the body, which is where the side effects come in. Okay. So targets of interest include these tumor-associated antigens. And like I said, these small cell lung cancers are neuroendocrine cells, so sometimes they have proteins on their surface that the rest of the body doesn't so we can go after them without injuring the rest of the body. This can take the form of targeted chemotherapy, which is what we call antibody drug conjugates. It can be, anti, it can be bispecific antibodies where the protein grabs on this, this antibody protein, this immune protein gloms onto the protein on the neuroendocrine cancer cell and it also gloms on to one of the immune cells, what we call a T cell, and it pulls them together, okay? And then CAR T cells are immune cells that are engineered to go after the cancer. So these are some of the antibody drug conjugates. So on the left right here are some of the proteins that are present on small cell lung cancer cells, about 60 to 70% of small lung cancer cells not all the same, fortunately. So like one small cell lung cancer might express DLL3, a different one might express TROP2, a different one, uh, B7H3. But you can test the cancer cell and say, okay, does it have the protein or not? And then if it does, you can have an antibody drug conjugate. The antibody drug conjugate is shown up on the right-hand corner. And that's an immune protein that will glom on to that target, for instance, DLL3, it'll glom onto that target that's on the cancer cell, then the cancer cell sucks that protein in, those little yellow spots right here, you probably can't see very well, right here, these are the chemos, these are the nasty toxins delivered by that immune protein, and they get dumped right into the cancer cell and it poisons them without poisoning the rest of the body so much, okay? So if we think of the platinum and etoposide, where you just mix it up in a bag and you run it through the vein and it goes everywhere and affects all the cells in the body, I'm gonna make a military analogy, okay? That's kind of like carpet bombing. When you have that big bomber go over a military base and they just drop a lot of bombs. They don't know where they're gonna drop but they just open the bomb bay, they just start falling. And you hope that it falls on a jet. You hope that it falls on a munitions dump, right? These antibody drug conjugates 
are more like those pictures that they show you on CNN or Fox or wherever, where the drone releases a, a little missile and you see a crosshair on the target and you just see it getting closer and closer and closer and closer and you've got a computer and an eye just drilling it right onto that target and bam, you hit the target. You're not dropping it everywhere. You're delivering that target right where you want it. This is a situation where we're delivering the chemo right to the cancer cell so that we're hitting the target and not so much hitting the rest of the body. So this has the potential to be very specific therapy where we're giving targeted chemotherapy in small cell lung cancer. And the reason that we have the potential to do that is that there are so many proteins like DL03, TROP2, B7H3, says C, CCAM7, where there's a protein on the small cell lung cancer service that's not on the rest of the body, so we can deliver chemo in a targeted, intelligent way, rather than just infusing it in the body and it goes everywhere. So this is a bispecific antibody, okay? And there's one that's already in clinical development through Amgen, terlatumab. And you can see the DLL3 there, that's one of our protein targets that is often present in small cell lung cancer but not on regular cells in the body. You've got an antibody that gloms onto the DL3, the other end of the antibody goes onto a T cell the T cells are the part of the immune system that attack cancer cells. And this antibody just grabs hold of the cancer cell, grabs hold of the T cell and brings them together so that the T cell has the potential to be cheek and jowl with that cancer cell and it can then see it and attack it. So promising results from the early clinical trials, some of the responses to this have been very durable. So this has the potential that we have more specific immune type treatment that has the potential to deliver those long-term responses that we want. This takes it to another level. This is cellular therapy. So there are now cellular therapies that are being developed against some target. This is a CAR T cell that is in clinical trials now against DLL3, where you have a T cell that is engineered to glom right onto the DLL3 and immediately activate the T cell. Usually these immune cells have about three or four different buttons that need to be pushed for them to activate and work. This is kind of a complex slide, but basically when the T cell gloms on, the whole thing that gloms on to the tumor cell not only recognizes the tumor cell, but it completely engages and turns the T cell on. So it not only locates, but it activates, okay? So this is kind of very advanced therapy, but it's already in the clinic. We're gonna see more and more of this. So where is small cell lung cancer in 2023? It remains a very challenging diagnosis and challenge for patients and their families, and we, we're not where we need to be. Small cell lung cancer causes unique, significant symptoms and other problems, in addition to the typical problems that cancer can cause patients and their families and their friends. But there's now hope for all stages of small cell lung cancer. Everybody diagnosed with small cell lung cancer has the hope of living a long time and doing well, but we're not where we need to be because we cannot tell people in all stages of the disease that that's the most likely outcome. But myself, Dr. Weiss, Dr. Liu, we see patients in clinic every day, every week, that have lived a long time and are doing well. That's different than 10 or 15 years ago. And, and for a person who comes in to talk about their diagnosis and their treatment, to be told, you know what, now there is hope. There is a chance, the realistic chance that two and three and four and five years from now you could be doing well is different than if their provider can't realistically tell them that. So that, that's really important. 
I think we're gonna be seeing people more with early stage lung cancer where they can be cured. It's important that we expand on that. Um, the immune therapy right now is what gives us hope for all patients, but now we have more and more ways of targeting it. And I think as we leverage these specific tumor associated antibodies, antigens for both antibody drug conjugates, by specific antibodies and cellular therapies that we're gonna see a dramatic improvement in outcomes. These are all in the clinic and showing positive results. Um, and, and it remains really important need to address all the needs of patients and their families and, and the lung cancer community, just helping people, being a resource, being there not only for the patients, but their families, because when, when a person has cancer, their family and their friends have cancer also. And as I started off this talk with, the fact that we have people in a room like this is different than it was 20 years ago, and that alone is a huge amount of progress. Um, so again, I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to come and talk to you. It's, it's, a, it's my privilege, and, uh, and when I come and, and meet with, with groups like you, I, I get inspired and I go back to clinic kind of uh, re-energized to try to do better um, and work harder on the research end and, and everything else. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Questions, I think you probably have some questions for Dr. Reddy, he's amazing. That was really well, well done and I, appreciate your sensitivity and, uh, and your passion also for screening. I feel exactly the same way. Any uh, questions or comments? Yes. Is immune therapy more for extensive small cell lung cancer? Right now that's where it's approved. So small, so immune therapy is proven treatment in extensive stage small cell lung cancer and FDA approved. There are clinical trials in limited extent small cell lung cancer with radiation and chemo adding it in and, and other therapies too. One thing that I forgot to mention that there's, a, there's been a recent advance in supportive care in small cell lung cancer with a me, with medicine called tricyclib that helps maintain blood counts during treatment. And that, that has also been a positive impact um, and, and Dr. Weiss has been involved a fair bit with that research, so I didn't cover it particularly because I, I haven't seen his slides, but I suspect he may talk about that tonight. You didn't mention the standard of care Yes. Chemo yes. So, we don't have immune therapy as part of standard care yet. Right, so there are clinical trials now that are going with standard treatment with or without immune therapy. And, and you might think, well, why don't we just add it in? It's bound to work. You know, we're, we're never as smart as we think we are. You know, we, we put something in a clinical trial and like we're 90% certain it's gonna work and then it doesn't. So we, we really, to build, to, to really be able to build, and, and, and I think that's frustrating for, you know, for patients and their families say, well, why don't we just add it in? But it's the sort of thing, if we just keep going and adding things in without knowing whether they work or not, we may be adding toxicity, bad outcomes and expense to an already too expensive healthcare system without knowing for sure. We have to be certain so that we're building on a solid foundation so that 10 years from now, we, we really make solid progress. But thank you very much for your question. Yes. I can't remember the name of the medication you mentioned about controlling blood cells. Uh, many of us were given Nulasta. Yes. Is there a difference between that and the one you mentioned. Yeah, so Nulast is still very helpful, you know, particularly in people when they get chemotherapy, when, they're, when their white blood count goes low. So the Nulast helps with white blood count. Uh, the tricyclib hits a different target. I think it's a TD, CDK4-6 inhibitor. Um, that also uh, helps protect platelets, which is another component. So it's a little broader effect on blood cells. But, but both, I, I use both depending on the situation and the patient and what's happening with the blood counts. Is, is that the drug that uh, G1 Therapeutics? Yes. Um, and just, I just wanted to mention and share with the group, so this, um, this drug 
which I trip on the name of it, but- um, Trilocyclib, yes. Thank you. <laughs> it's uh, approved for small cell um, lung cancer patients. However, you know, they're doing some more work to get it approved for not only non-small cell lung cancer, but also other, um, other cancers. And it, it's weird because while this is working apparently very well for small cell patients, um, they had some disappointing data recently. And so for some of the other cancers that they had expected it to also do well, might need some more analyzing of the data, but it's doing better in small cell than it, than it appears to be on the surface for some of the other cancers. So um, at least, you know, we've got, we've got that. That's so that, that, so the trial of cycle has been, been helpful in maintaining blood counts, which is important to maintaining, safely maintaining treatment. There was, there was some, excuse me, some data that suggests that it might also have an anti-cancer effect. So far, I haven't, so far I think that the trials that I've seen that were asking the question, is it helpful as an anti-cancer therapy? I haven't seen, I have not seen positive results for that yet. Okay, but still it helps us to fight the cancer, to be healthy yeah. enough to fight the cancer in yeah. other ways. Any other questions? Yes, Mita. Yes. Doctor, do you have experience with using Zometa for people? I, I developed more tumors in my vertebrae and then my mm -hmm. oncologist wanted to start me on the Zometa mm -hmm. like four times a year or something. And I talked to my dentist and it can have some pretty serious side effects. Yeah. So I'm wondering how you feel. So there, there, are a number of, there are a number of different medicines that are sometimes used for people with painful bony metastasis that strengthen the bones. Uh, Zomate is one of them. Uh, the, the, the whole class of bisphosphonates, several of them. So that's a, that, that depends. It, like everybody with bone metastasis doesn't need it. In selected cases, it's fine. Uh, in general, the, ch the chances of having the severe side effect that your dentist was worried about, which is basically necrosis of the jawbone, is, uncom is very uncommon if your teeth are okay. In other words, you don't have a bunch of dental abscesses and you haven't had your mandible radiated before, like happens in people with head and neck cancers. So generally they're safe. Yes, another question? Yeah, I'm not sure that I completely followed something that you said about the, um, the bladder extreting the sodium based upon um, your cancer creating yeah. a, a particular protein. And the reason I asked is that is something that my, my boyfriend experienced. And um, we were told that, you know, it, it is a side effect of one of the drugs that he was taking and they monitor the sodium levels. But right. one thing I didn't know as his caregiver is one of the symptoms that I should have been looking for was his brain fog. And when right. your sodium level drops down below 136, you get significant brain fog. So I'm wondering, like, is it wasn't widely shared yeah. with, by the pharmacist? And so I, so I, so, um, and I drew, so, uh, Antidiuretic hormone is a hormone that kind of keeps your, your fluid and salts in balance. If the small cell lung cancer secretes into the blood huge amounts of antidiuretic hormone, it can cause the kidneys to waste sodium, okay? Now in my experience, people generally don't have significant symptoms until the sodium gets well below 130. So when I see people with sodiums like 120, 115, often those people may be really ill. Generally in the 130 to 136 range, not so much. There are a lot of reasons you can have a sodium in the 130 to 136 range. Mostly would be medications. So, um, so there, there are a lot of medicines that can also cause the sodium to go down a little bit. So certainly any of the diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide, Lasix, there are a whole bunch of medicines that can cause a little bit of low sodium. Uh, small cell lung cancer is relatively unique and it can cause really low sodiums. And, and in those situations, people can be very ill. Um, I wanted to ask a question because we've heard about uh, people with 
non-small cell lung cancer. It uh, mutates into small cell. And I wondered if you could just um, address that. And also, have, have you ever heard of it doing the other way around, small cell converting to non-small cell? So to, add, to answer your last question first, generally not. So um, it's been known for like 30 or 40 years that occasionally patients present with a mixed cancer where the cancer is biopsied and half of it is non-small cell, the other half is small cell. So that's really common. Um, what has, what, what really took everybody by surprise over the last 10 years is that for patients who have EGFR mutated lung cancer, which is typically a cancer of non-smokers who have been treated with one of the oral therapies for a long time, a year or two or three years, and the cancer then starts to grow again, about one out of 10 cases, it's because the non-small cell lung cancer has transformed into a small cell lung cancer which speaking for us, that just blew me away. It just like, it, yeah, I, I, so, but what's become apparent is that particularly in small cell lung cancer, there's a fair degree of plasticity where the small cell lung cancer can kind of change, be a little bit of a chameleon and change over time um, from one small cell lung cancer variant to a different one transform from an EGFR mutated or maybe even ALK translocated cancer into a small cell. So there's a fair bit of what we would call a lineage plasticity or ability to change in the small cell area that I think has just really become appreciated over the last five years or so. That was something that was discussed at a, a big lung cancer meeting that I was just at a few weeks ago with one of the world's experts on small cell lung cancer biology, a guy named Charlie Rudin at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I was at that meeting. It was very scientific. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Too much for me. But yeah. um, Copen Copenhagen was cold, yes. <laughs> any other questions for Dr. Reddy? Here. Yes. Tessa, hang on. Get it in. The mixed presentation how do they treat that? Will it be treated as a small, can small cell lung cancer? Yes. Okay. Other questions? Thank you for all these great questions. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, let's and go. If it, and if everybody, if everybody was feeling a little bit shy, I'll hang around a little while and you can just talk to me directly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and really, thank you, very, thank you very much for the invitation. It was a great honor to be able to treat, uh, speak to you all.